All right, so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the a &R Extension Educator for uh, Clay and Owen counties in Indiana. For those of you not familiar with it, those are the counties right between um, Terre Haute and Bloomington. Uh, and what we're gonna be talking about this evening is an interesting one for me. We are gonna be talking about bats. So for those of you who are already familiar with me, you know that I am an entomologist. I usually study bugs and I love talking about them. Tonight, I'm gonna to be talking about one of their best predators and one of our favorite animals that we love to hate and do all kinds of things with because they kind of drive us crazy in some instances. However, these are really important animals. They provide us a lot of services and they're critical to our ecosystems, the bat. So why don't we go ahead and dive in so Indiana is home to several species of bats, and we're really fortunate in that regard. But unfortunately, we have a serious issue. Most of our species of bats exist in a state of either concern or endangered status within the state of Indiana. Now, it's important that you recognize that distinction because some of these species aren't considered endangered overall, but within our state, they are. So I've got them labeled here, just a few things that I wanna highlight. One that we're going to be very familiar with and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later will be the big brown bat. Um, if you have seen a bat in your home or outside your home, I virtually guarantee you is probably a big brown bat. They are very common here in Indiana. They're so common that they don't currently have any kind of conservation status appended to them as per the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Another one that we're probably fairly familiar with is going to be the little brown bat. I know, great naming convention there. Um, this one is fairly common, but unfortunately its numbers have dropped and they have entered a state endangered status. Most of the other bats that you will see on here are generally not considered to be common enough that we're gonna recognize them very easily. However, uh, due to the work of the biologists who specialize in them, they are being recognized as either special concern and that their numbers are showing to drop or they are endangered within the state of Indiana. Another thing that I want you to recognize too on this slide in particular is that I've split them into three categories, cave bats, migratory tree bats, and bats that are kind of rare here in the state. So it's gonna be important that we keep that in mind because that's really gonna be a great descriptor of behavior. Now, primarily, we're gonna focus on cave bats. Uh, migratory, the, the fact that some bats migrate though is kind of important to some of the things we're gonna address later on. So like I mentioned a moment ago, we're gonna primarily focus on two of these bats, the big brown bat that you can see right here. This is probably one that a lot of us have seen. I'm fairly certain that my partner has taken a couple out of our house because I'm kind of a coward when it comes to bats flying around my head. Don't tell anybody. Um, but this is one that we're gonna be most familiar with. Little brown bats are these cute little guys here that you see, and they like to smoosh up underneath eaves and things and stick really, really close together in whatever uh, colony or nursery they're occupying. And they're just kind of adorable in my opinion, but that's just me. Now, you know, as a, a lot of you already know when I talk about different animals, I like to talk about the order an animal belongs to. And what this is, this is a classification that biologists use. So you may have learned in school how we organize living organisms according to um, a type of international nomenclature. So you probably heard of animals being grouped by kingdom, phylum, class, order, down, all the way down to genus and species. Order helps us because it organizes animals that share a lot of very similar body characteristics. In insects, I might say all beetles are a single order, and they are Coleoptera. In this case, bats all belong to a single order. They are order Chiroptera. They are, these are the only mammals capable of true sustained flights, meaning bats can take off and maintain their flight they don't just simply glide through the air like a sugar glider might. They can actually flap their wings and fly. Now, chiroptera means hand wing, terra meaning wing, chiro meaning hand, like left and right hand, chirality, that kind of thing. They are the only mammals capable of sustained flight, like I said. They're also really well known for using hibernation as a strategy to survive winter temperatures. Now, I did mention early, some bats migrate. That's another strategy that they can use to survive the winter. 
The ones that we are going to be most familiar with here in Indiana, however, they are going to be our hibernators. They're going to find a nice place to hang out and go to sleep for the winter. Bat species can be insectivorous, meaning they eat insects as a primary food source, or herbivorous, essentially eating fruit in this case. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen pictures of different fox bats and other things that can consume uh, large fruits and bananas and things like that. Um, there is a species of bat that does exist that can be a blood feeder, the infamous vampire bat. Um, however, that's not one that we really are going to be talking about this evening. And you probably will never see one, so you don't have to worry about it. Bats are also really well known for their ability to perform a skill known as echolocation. Um, this is one of the ones that we really recognize as a trait amongst bats. And this is the ability to create echoes using their voice. Uh, they can pitch out a sound. And then as that sound echoes off of objects and things in their environment, they can get an idea of what is in their environment, the distance, even the texture of objects as they are flying through the air. Imagine that for a moment, that their hearing is so finely tuned that they can squeak. And when that squeak echoes back to them, they can tell that you are wearing a sweater. That to me is just incredible. That is an incredible skill in nature. What this does is it helps them identify prey while they're flying at night because these guys are eating insects. The ability to identify insects, identify their speed, what elevation they're flying at, and even arguably the kind of insect, because if they can detect temp uh, texture, they could probably detect the shape of an insect's body, so they know what they are hunting. Now, bats have unique hearing and vocalization compared to most other ma uh, mammals or animals in general. Bats have a large range when it comes to this one. And what I want you to do for a moment is just close your eyes and picture those nights in the summer where you go outside and you could hear a bat squeaking. I'm sure a lot of us have seen and heard this before. And just for a moment, keep in mind that the squeaks that the bat is making can span a range from 9,000 hertz to 200,000 hertz. So let's put this in perspective. Our hearing takes place between roughly 15 and 20,000 hertz. So we have a fairly narrow range. The bats can go much further than that. If they squeak beyond that 20,000 range, we can't hear it. So that means that those intermittent squeaks that you're hearing in the night of a bat flying, you're only hearing the ones that your ears are letting you hear. There's probably several dozen more that are actually going on. Bats will use their vocalizations to bounce it off of prey and objects to be able to detect them. And as they get closer to what they are currently hunting or flying towards, they'll increase the rapidity of their squeaks. Kind of like think of it just suddenly making a machine gun sound almost. And we can't hear that, but it is happening. That's how they fly. And that's what they do as they approach their prey. Now we recognize bats for their hearing. And we recognize that that ability really, really determines what they're going to do. But what about their other senses? Bats are mammals. They have their roughly five senses, because you could argue that body position is also a sense. So what about those other senses? How do they play into how a bat lives and what it does? Well, there are some fallacies for us to dispel. Bats aren't blind. First off, the phrase blind as a bat is unfortunately inaccurate. Bats actually have vision that's nearly as good as ours. Um, however, they just have developed their hearing and other senses to aid in their hunting much further. They have also a really well-developed sense of smell. They do this so not only can they track prey with it, they can also identify family members. Remember, bats live in colonies. Often those colonies are split by what stage of reproduction female bats are in, so into nursery colonies. If a bat leaves her young behind to do a night's hunting, so that way she can keep making milk in her body, she has to return to her young and be able to find them in the midst of possibly thousands of bats that are all roosting in this nursing colony. So her sense of smell will let her locate her young. 
So we've talked about their senses a little bit. We've talked about how they hunt their prey. And I've already kind of broken this one open, but let's talk a little bit about what do bats eat? What are they actually going for? Now, about 70% of all bats are going to be insect feeding. And this includes on crop pests and our ever beloved mosquito. So for those of you who are interested, if you recall last year, right around this time, we were talking a lot about fall army worm and how much they were destroying alfalfa fields and yards and other things. Bats hunt fall army worm. What they do is they hunt the adults and they remove them from being able to reproduce. And they'll do this very, very actively. This is why our bats are important. They're providing these services for us. Research has indicated that when it comes to when these bats are hunting, they can consume literally hundreds of mosquito-sized bugs in the space of an hour. Think about that. They are eating machines in the space of an hour, hundreds of bugs the size of a mosquito. That is a huge service that they are providing, protecting humans and other animals from pest insects, our gardens and our crops from insects that are going to be herbivorous on them. Uh, we cannot possibly overstress that one. Bats are also capable not only hunting insects in flight, but they can do what's known as gleaning. They will glean insects off of plant surfaces or building surfaces uh, just as readily as they will hunt them on the wing. So th these guys are really kind of your one-stop shop for pest management uh, when it comes to at least insects. Now, there are some bat species that will consume nectar and fruits. Most of those bat species are not going to be indigenous to Indiana. Our bat species are primarily insectivorous. However, um, we do see a lot of great images and a lot of great YouTubes, I'm sure, of fruit bats and other ones that are going to be doing their services. We see cute videos of them being rehabilitated and eating a banana or something. But what they also do in the areas where they are indigenous is they help um, pollinate different plants that can be critical to the industry in some areas. For example, uh, certain species of cactus and agave bats are major pollinators of. And this is primarily in Central and South America and a little bit into the American Southwest as well. So even fruit bats or nectivorous bats are having an impact on the American farm industry. Now, a little bit about some of their more interesting behaviors. We've already talked about some really cool things when it comes to echolocation and things similar to that. But now let's go over how they overwinter. This is where we begin to run into a few problems when it comes to our bats. Bats either migrate or they will hibernate. Now we do, like I showed you at the beginning of this evening's program, we do have a few migratory species that will be here and they'll move on as the temperature and the daylight period begin to change. However, we do have species that are gonna hibernate. And these are the ones where we tend to run into problem with them as humans. Hibernation is going to be extremely reliant on the amount of fat the bat is able to build up and be able to reserve in the winter months. What this means is that when a bat hibernates, it's looking for a location where it will remain relatively undisturbed, it, in fact, very undisturbed, and it's going to lower its heartbeat and its breathing rate down to extremely low levels. Any kind of disturbance during their hibernation period is going to result in the bat's losing an immense amount of their body fat due to this. And we are talking about some activity can cost literally months off of that bat's life as they hibernate. When they are looking for these quiet locations, what they're looking for are places very similar to our homes, our attics, under eaves, and garages and barns. Um, some bats need much more quiet and secure locations. Some bats can do something with an open drafty barn. It depends on the species. Unfortunately, this can result in a few problems with humans. Bats do carry a pest insect called a bat bug. It is related to the bed bug. They are almost the same species. However, bat bugs do not survive well on humans. They don't infest your home like a bed bug would. You don't need to clean every single thing in your home and hope that they don't come back. As long as you remove the bats and remove the source, primarily from guanos where you're going to find these, the bat waste, you will get rid of the bat bug. 
Um, however, it is something to be conscious of. You can easily prevent bats from getting into your home too, because they're gonna take advantage of holes. They're gonna take advantage of places where maybe your siding isn't meeting the corners of your home very well. They're going to find the space in between the double layer walls of your garage or your house to be able to roost in safely to avoid things. Sealing holes, putting up screens, any very similar activities to that are going to help reduce the incidence of bat colonies being put in the structure of your house or your barn. Now, keep in mind, though, when you do these things, if they aren't damaging your home or doing anything else, if you block bats, you are losing a service. They are going to help clean out insects. What I would strongly advise all of you to do is to talk to local wildlife specialists. For example, in Terre Haute, we have conservationists in the Audubon Society at Dobbs Park, um, and they have a bat festival every year. Talk to folks like this to learn how to put up bat houses. So that way you can provide that roosting space for bats and you can still derive those services and give them a safe place to shelter. However, giving them those things won't prevent all the problems. There is one major problem that bats have to deal with, unfortunately, that is hard to prevent. Some of you have already heard of this, known as white nose syndrome. And what you're seeing here, this poor little brown bat, is infected with white nose syndrome. Uh, and it does not have a good survival rate, unfortunately. So what this is, this is an invasive cold loving fungus um, that was first identified in New York in 2006. It was found developing on the surface of bat skin while they're in their hibernaculum, the place where they're hibernating. What happens is since the fungus is present, it's going to develop across their muzzle, their ears, and often on the skin that covers their wings, and it will wake bats up. It will cause them to go dehydrated. It'll cause them to starve because they'll wake up and start moving because they have something unpleasant growing on them. And it will cause them to also begin to change their behavior. Bats infected with white nose fungus will move to the mouth of their hibernaculum and fly out even during winter days and often into daytime. And what this means is that the bat, if they do that during when they're supposed to be hibernating, it will most likely freeze to death. Um, it is just not a good situation. Unfortunately also, the fungus may not be visibly present, but what wildlife specialists started doing is they've started watching for the changes in bat's behavior because even though the fungus may not be visible, those behavioral changes are still going to exist. So here's some unfortunate news. As a result of white nose syndrome, approximately 90% of a few different species of bats have been lost. That is an immense loss. Um, I, as someone who works in the field of biology, I can't even describe to you how much of a loss that is. Uh, that means several species have nearly been extirpated and we will not see them again. And that's very unfortunate. Indiana species are being affected by white nose syndrome. And this includes our big brown bat, the little brown bat, uh, the more rare tricolored bat, and the Indiana bat. They have been found to have those symptoms. And I'm sure that we will find more. Unfortunately, this fungal pathogen takes advantage of the fact that bats roost close together in their colonies. They stay unmoving meaning the spores of the fungus can easily spread between all the bats there. And that's why you see this 90% mortality. Um, there are several different agencies that are currently studying this issue because the loss of our bats to our environment will be a huge hit. Uh, not only just simply because we love our wildlife, but also because we're going to lose important services that protect us too. So going back to talking a little bit about our two species that we're going to be most familiar with. I'm only going to spend a little bit more time on this. So we have our big brown bat here. This is a species that is extremely common to encounter in urban and rural areas. So we've had a couple of bats fly into my house. Um, and what we found is they really, really like to fly into your windows or your doors at night because um, they can either sense the warmth or they can sense maybe potential food in that area. So they'll buzz in. Um, I think we had one fly into our studio one evening because it was finding warmer locations. Uh, most likely it had lost its way to its roost or something like that, and we had to get it out of our home. 
Um, but all of us have probably seen a big brown bat. They're also extremely tolerant of unstable conditions. So they can go ahead and hang out and roost in your barn or something like a shed that may be less stable. It might be a little bit windier or it might move and rattle and make a bunch of noise. So they can go into silos, storm sewers even, even mines. So in the area that I'm in, in Clay and Owen counties, we have a lot of old strip mines. Um, some of you may live in areas that actually have old, fat, the true mines that aren't strip mines, like the cave mines and things like that, where you'll find bats. And these are the bats that you would find there. And big brown bats, if they are going to roost in someone's home, they're going to go into like the space between double walling or boxed in eaves where they can have a nice protected spot. Now for the big brown bat, when it comes to their feeding behavior, these are really, really, I'll say chompy bats. They have really strong jaws. So they are able to take advantage of beetle species that are really heavily armored insects. They can chomp right through them, they'll consume them. So you'll see bats flying on nights where there'll be fireflies or maybe some other um, buzzing beetles going by like lady beetles and things like that. They're not limited to beetles, they'll eat anything, but they're able to go up into those bigger, heftier ones. Now their feeding is gonna be confined to the warmer months. So that means that the bat is hibernating through almost all the cool periods. So when they consume food, they are again, eating machines. They are not gonna be awake when there's no prey available. And when the prey is available, they're gonna feed right after sunset until they are completely full. They're gonna roost temporarily to digest their food and turn it into fat. And then they're gonna to return to their daytime roost before the sun comes up again. So we've got a question, what are the sizes of the big and little brown bats? Um, off the top of my head, I cannot recall, Gail. However, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources actually has that information on their webpage. And I'll be happy to email you their website once we are done with this program and I send out the copy of the recording because you can actually look up all the sizes and different facts about all these bats I'm talking about on the IDNR website. So in terms of life cycle for our big brown bat, so females are going to form a maternity colony composed of pregnant females, pups, and their mothers. So basically it's just going to be moms and the kids in these colonies as they either gestate or begin feeding their young. Um, pregnant bats will be very reluctant to fly. They're going to go through gestation and give birth. Whereas once they've given birth, mothers will go out to hunt and they'll leave their pups behind. So keep in mind, they have to do this because if they don't, they will either A, not be able to produce enough milk to feed their pups, or B, not be able to produce enough fat to survive the winter. And they need to get their pups big enough and old enough so that way they could survive the winter as well. Big brown bats can survive in the wild up to 19 years. That is a huge amount of time for a mammal this size. Um, so they are extremely long lived. However, we often see that mortality is linked to interruption to their hibernation. So when, they when that hibernation cycle gets interrupted, like we walk into a cave and wake them all up, um, we're literally costing them their lives. We are shaving months and years off their life. So we need to work with our local conservationists to identify where those hibernacula are and respect them. So that way we don't cost our bats time. So a little bit into the little brown bat. Uh, this is another bat that's closely associated with urban areas. However, the name is very accurate. Big brown bats are kind of think of your traditional bat size, maybe a few inches in length, maybe like four to five. Little brown bats are like two thirds of that, maybe half of that. They're really small. They can inhabit forested areas near water, though sometimes they can be also be found in drier climates, depending on the subspecies. They actually have a fairly extended habitat range. They can cover several latitudes and elevations. So they're very adaptable. However, white nose syndrome is hitting their population extremely hard. And they, white nose syndrome has taken out about 90% of their currently living populations. So uh, I fear that we will be seeing the, white, the little brown bat going extinct before too long unless we can get this disease under control. So for feeding behaviors of our little brown bat, they're gonna use similar tactics to the big brown bat. However, they don't have these strong jaws, so they're not gonna be going after beetles. They're going to be going after swarming insects. Uh, 
So think of swarms of gnats and midges that we all hate. They are swooping through and feeding on those to try to use a strategy to increase their feeding efficiency. Most of these guys will eat half their body weight in one night and lactating females, basically females who have young, will consume 110% of their body weight in insects before returning to roost. Like I said earlier, they are eating machines and they are also eliminating pests on water surfaces because they will go after the midges. So that is another thing that they are helping us out with because midges will bite humans. They're very irritating. Now the life cycle of little brown bats, they do not pair up. Instead, they mate promiscuously. The males do not mate until they are at least one year of age. So they'll be born, they'll survive a year in hibernation and then eating again, and then they will begin to mate. Now mating with little brown bats is a bit interesting. So a female can actually store sperm in her body from a male for up to seven months. So that way she can time her fertilization with the spring. The females are basically trying to avoid being pregnant during winter months, so the energy investing into their young isn't taken away from the energy she needs to survive hibernation. The interesting part comes with how mating is done. Mating will be done with either conscious, awake, and on-the-wing bats, or unconscious ones. And research found that apparently 30% of mating in little brown, or little brown bats is actually homosexual. So they are not very picky when it comes to their mating time. Um, mating is primarily going to occur in late summer and fall. And like I said, the sperm will be stored in the female's body. And then the pups are going to be born after a 60 day gestation, typically in June and July, which if you think about it, that often corresponds when we begin to hear some more bats coming out too. They're gonna stay with their mother, and eventually they'll be able to start flying after three weeks and then become completely independent from their mothers at four weeks of age. So with all that really fascinating information that you guys got, there's just one thing I want to address. And that is one thing we can do to protect our bat species. And that is by controlling predation. Cats are perhaps the biggest predators of bats. Now, don't get me wrong. There are going to be several things that are going to hunt bats, including like occipiters and red tails, hawks, raptors, raccoons, snakes, but domesticated cats are particularly bad because what they can do is they can reach into the spaces around our homes and urban areas to be able to reach the bats and they will very readily go after them. And if you don't think a cat can't catch a bat on the wing, you have never watched your cat hunt before. Trust me, they can reach them. They can grab them right out of the air. Um, so what we need to do is we need to be mindful about how much we're actually letting our cats out. Preferably, don't let them out at all. Um, keep them indoors. It's safer that way, and it's better for the cat's life anyways. But if we can limit how much our cats are going outside, we will be able to control how much damage they could potentially do to our local bat population. All right, and with that, that is what I had for you this evening. I've got my contact information up here, including the phone numbers for both of my offices, as well as my email address. I've also got links to the Purdue Ed Store and the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. If you have questions about how to handle issues with your plants, they can help you address them.